Hey guys, first, I just want to say thank you for letting me take over DMing this week for Luke. I know he is a great dungeon master. I have some extremely huge shoes to fill, but I appreciate the opportunity. Um, actually, he's probably one of the worst dungeon masters we've ever had. Yeah, no kidding. He was never prepared for the game sessions. And there were never enough innocent NPCs to stab in the back either. And he was always in flagrant violation of corporate but policy too. Especially the regulations about fudging but, but, dice. But you guys, he he was he was nice, and and he had a pretty beard. Well, I do have a pretty beard too. Ooh, that's a good point. But you're a newbie, so you're gonna have to prove your valor. That's right. And according to the Dungeon Master Handbook, in order to become DM certified, you have to survive no fewer than 20 game sessions with a dysfunctional group of players. Okay, sure. So where can I find a group like that? Holy crap! What an idiot! Yeah, buddy. You're, you're pretty much looking at the worst group of D&D players that's ever been assembled. Yeah, and we all have pretty beards, too. Indeed. You could say that as far as D&D &D players go, we all pretty much suck. And you, my handsome bearded friend, will need all the help you can get. Oh, great. If only there were some resources and advice out there to help new dungeon masters like me. Holy crap, what an idiot. Hey, you already said that once in this skit. So? Yeah, well, well anyway, Mr. Noob Dungeon Master, we all actually know a guy who knows a guy who has a bunch of cats and makes DM advice videos. That's right. And he also has a beard, which is required according to page 233 of the Dungeon Master Handbook. And it just so happens that today, he'll be going over all of his best advice for new Dungeon Masters. Yeah, so pay attention or we'll cut that beautiful beard right off your face. Welcome to the DM Layer. I'm Luke Hart, and I've been a Dungeon Master since high school. On this channel, I give practical Dungeon Master advice that you can use in your Dungeons & Dragons games. Today in the Layer, I'll be joining teams with Alan from the Dungeon Coach YouTube channel to give you our top 10 tips and pieces of advice for new Dungeon Masters. Now, five of these tips are in this video you're watching right now, and the other five are over on his channel. So, when you're done here, you can head over to his channel, The Dungeon Coach, for the rest of the tips. And of course, links to his channel and that video will be placed conveniently down below. By the way, The Dungeon Coach is a reservoir of information about homebrew content for D&D games. So if you're looking to spice things up, I suggest you check his content out. I also want to let you know that in the month of May, I'm trying to raise as much money as I can for Stack Up. Stack Up is a military charity that supports veteran mental health through gaming. So if you want to help the men and women who serve our country, you can donate a little something at the link below. And now the tips begin. Number one, don't listen to the no prep idiots on Reddit. <laughs> oh, they think they're so cool. Well, I don't prep anything. We just, they just go right into it on the fly, on the fly. Dude, they don't do anything. They're just like, they just cruise in, no prep at all. And everything just comes out naturally. It's just like, wee, I'm That's awesome, how man. That's everyone should do it. Yeah, and, and the problem is, the problem is that new dungeon masters are all like, woo, I want to learn, I want to do this stuff. They go over to places like Reddit, and it could be anywhere. It could be Facebook, Reddit, I don't care. They go over to these places, and they start reading DM advice and stuff. And there is a large segment of people over there that are purporting that you don't, you, you shouldn't prep much at all. That if you're prepping for your game sessions, you're somehow railroading your players and that it's horrible and stuff. And so they'll sit there and they'll go on about how they hardly prep at all and their games are amazing. And it's creative and free flowing. <laughs> Everybody does whatever they do. I just mix them up on the fly. It's no stress at all. Well, there's there's oh. yeah, there's two things going on right there. One, one, they're running their mouths off to stroke their own egos. That's the first thing that's going on for How many cool of them. They yeah. They're trying to get karma on the karma system on Reddit or something, but they're basically just like trying to make themselves seem all awesome. Now, here's the thing. There are lots of dungeon masters that can run awesome games with very little prep. For but sure. you know what those dungeon masters are? They're very dungeon masters. experienced. Yes, <laughs> dude, they have years of yeah. experience yeah. and they can just like, oh yeah, I can whip out a dungeon and I can just make stuff up as I go. Not a problem. And the game session will still be fun, but, but let me make a, let me make an assertion here. Um, it might still be an awesome game session, but I would argue that it would probably would have been even better. If you were more prepared, at least. Yeah. 
Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If they had prepped, that experienced dungeon yeah. master having prepped would have been even better than right. if they didn't prep at all. And one of my quotes is that uh, that I try and remember for myself is, is it's easier to adapt than create, right? So if you can create a bunch of stuff beforehand and then adapt it on the fly and be fluid and be cool and all that kind of stuff, yeah, sure. But it's a lot mm -hmm. easier to make, make changes that you already had something in front of you and change it to something that's cool and, and inspired in the moment and all that kind of stuff instead of just being unprepared, which for me, some of the most stressful moments in D&D &D have been when I'm like, not prepared and i'm stressing out because they're about to go somewhere where i have not prepared and i'm like and then you know that's where you're kind of tested and stuff but that's again where yes. some experience should come through to be able to get you out of that yeah exactly and so you really should prep especially new dungeon masters and that's what this video yeah. is about it's about new dungeon masters you should prep for your games and that's what we're Do trying not to whittle things down and try and get you get you toned up to where you can have a little less stuff and be more experienced and have a little yeah. bit more understanding. But I would say when I first started, I would prep the same amount of hours or more. If we we're going to play for four hours, I would prep for probably four to maybe even eight hours, just mm -hmm. which is, which is honestly too much. I was probably too prepping mm -hmm. too much, but that's part of the learning process of being a new dungeon master is refining that down to where you can do half the time or, or less. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, how much is too much and how, we could, that's a deep dive for another day maybe, <laughs> but like, I mean, I still, I'll run a four hour game session and I might, I will easily prep two hours for it. Oh yeah. Experience dungeon master. Know what could I, wing a game session? Could I absolutely do no prep and wing a game session? Yes, I've done it many, many times. I had right. an entire game, my Wonder Panda campaign that ran for years, and I did almost no prep for it. So can it yeah. be done? Can Experience Dungeon Master do it? Absolutely. But for my games that I really want to be good, I still spend about two hours, if not four hours, per game session oh, yeah. getting my crap ready. And that is not including planning the adventure i still wrote the adventure i still planned yeah. the adventure you had to make that Th yeah. that that is not part of my game prep okay that is something that i do pre-game prep and then my yeah. game prep is preparing that adventure that i already wrote getting right. the minis ready in roll 20 getting picking out my miniatures planning out different things oh, for sure reading reading through the monster stat block so that i know it's how on to the tip run of your mind monster. you're ready yeah yeah, yeah, I yeah. got. I can't just like pull out a wizard. Oh yeah, what was that that I wrote a month ago? That I... Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. And, and wizards, you have to know what they can do, what spells they have, how the spells work, which spells yeah. you should cast so first. You're gonna which slow the game way down. You got to plan that crap yeah. out. So yeah, well, you got to You got to do some prep. And even on that, like, just to, don't worry about prepping too much. Is that all those times where I did prep too much? Mm -hmm. I. I reused that later, or I, I was ready for when they went there eventually. Like I prepared an entire city, the biggest city I'd ever prepared, and they went the other direction. That's fine. They'll eventually go there. You know, like a month or two later, they went back there, and I was I was ready for it. So no big yeah. deal. Yeah, and then That's a, awesome. another thing you said that I think is important is is it's part of like an intermediate or advanced dungeon master tip is once I felt confident of my dungeon mastering, I was like, okay, let's do the, like my next session. I was like, how much prep can I get away with, but still be prepared mm -hmm. for and not ride that line of like, you know, uh, scrambling around and stuff so that I, yeah. I had like a high school group that I played with them, a, a high school teacher. So I was mm -hmm. like, this is a lot less stressful. They're not coming over. There's nothing, there's no extreme minis. It's a lot of theater of the mind and stuff. And it's just much more relaxed. So I was like, mm -hmm. that's when I tested myself, uh, how much can I prepare? And just kind of feel it out there more just to push yourself as a DM. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, let me ask you this high school group. So high school <laughs> students, did you kill their characters from time to time? <laughs> Come on, be honest. My be honest. first kill of a PC was against an at a high school student. Yes. So yes. ruthless. No. No. Now, did they go pulled. off in a corner and cry? Um. No. Now there was a yeah. big. I, I asked for the character sheet across the table and ripped it up and everything. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but, that's awesome. And and here's the thing. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I, I. I. That's a mini tangent. But it's beautiful <laughs> because those kids are learning that this is a game. Yeah. That part of the game is your character's die. It's okay. And to man up or woman up or whatever yeah. you want to say and be able to take that stuff in stride yeah. and not get all worked up and bent out of shape about it. I know I've known adults that throw temper tantrums yeah, no, if their I character dies. I want to play my character though. Yeah. Oh, she yeah. it's it's not cool. Well, <laughs> and, and honestly, at the table, there's a lot of emotions there. That's a whole that's another video tangent. We got a lot of these to do. Uh, yeah. That's a, is that there's some emotions there of like, wow, we just lost it, or like other characters felt responsible because their mm -hmm. character. So like, and that that feeling is a good feeling to have yeah. and flush out and talk about. But yeah, afterwards, every game session after that. That's awesome. One of one of the um 
the, the tenets or sayings that I have with regard to prep is that a dungeon master does not rise to the occasion. They fall to the highest level of preparation. So yeah. when you're under stress and you have to improvise, you don't know, it, it's like, woo! Like, you are going to do as well as you prepared to do. Yeah. You're not going to just suddenly pull out expertise and awesomeness out of nowhere, having done no preparation for yeah. it, having no experience for it. You're going to you're gonna crash and burn. So when, when tensions are high, however much you've prepared and however ready you are, that's how well you're going to do. Number two, speaking of everything we just talked about, is how to actually prep like how can you prepare in, in the least amount of time because you can spend four hours prepping but if you're really inefficient and are prepping things that you don't actually end up using but how to be efficient with your prep to kind of lower the amount of time it takes efficiency wise you want to be efficient when you prep dude oh yeah <laughs> you don't want to just sit there for two days prepping stuff come on man come on i spent three days and i'm ready for neck tomorrow <laughs> that's like the opposite of the reddit folks who prep who talk about no prep it's yeah. the guy who's like i spent oh, a week <laughs> a week preparing for my game <laughs> it was amazing <laughs> my players loved it they they didn't do anything i prepared for ah! it's like, <laughs> my main thing I first think about is story beats, like what's happening in the game, what could possibly happen, and think about where your players are. Um, and you've you've done videos on Sandbergs versus Railroad or anything, mm -hmm. but just think about what could be possible for them to do. Just try and get in their heads, think about what's happening. This is easier with more experience, and when you've played with your pe players long enough to know mm -hmm. and listen listen to them at the table, they're kind of give you some clues of what's going on, or like what are you guys thinking about doing, like what you guys think, like what are your guys thought, like where do you want to go, you know. Yeah. So you can have those little questions you ask them to know like where could they possibly go and that's kind of where i first start thinking them yeah so like one of the things that i do for my games is so you have your game session your players do stuff right they make decisions they have actions they 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 awaken a slumbering eaten or entity you know some powerful being that marches off into the game world they they tick off a coven of hags or something and these Un, these unresolved things are out yes, there yes. that are a result of your players' decisions and a result of their actions. I keep notes on those things. They go into a little little thing that I keep in one note. Um, I call them future plot points. They are yep. things that I might pull back, pull on in the future. And it kind of reminds mm -hmm. me of the story beats type of thing. It's it's major events or major situations or things that might happen. Yeah. And and the way that I do those, and they're always based upon something my players have done or a decision they've right. made the that past. will later mm -hmm. come back to have consequences for them. Yeah. And so it, it makes the world feel like living and breathing and it makes it feel like they are empowered to affect the world. Because look at, we made this decision like, a half a year ago and now this thing is happening and it's our fault <laughs> yeah know? i separate mine into like past and future like i th i think of what they've done like what things have happened in the past and like i write those down if there's some sort of like you're saying mm -hmm. lingering effect that happens i call it a trigger or something okay. like they've been cursed and every like i had one curse on a player where the next the next thing that they killed it didn't actually kill it it would come back to life as a zombie I, they did not know that but uh -huh. I had to remember that thing and yes. I have that written down as a trigger, a very specific section of my Dungeon Master screen to, to remind yeah. myself because I will forget. Yes. Uh, so those past triggers and then future things of what could possibly happen? What's go what is the BBEG doing? What are the things around the area they're at doing? All those types, like what's happening in the world? Sometimes those do come, like you said, from things they've done and put out into the world. And now there's this person hunting them down. That would be some sort of, you know, and I just try and think about what's happening around them to be able to throw at them at a moment's notice. So that's huge yeah. prep for me. And then the, uh, I would say maps though is a is a scary thing to prep because if 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 you're if you're out of nowhere and you're like oh they dude. just ran off into the oh I don't dude. have a map for that whoa, whoa. dude I cannot prep like dude I I need a map okay like it, if I have a map of a dungeon I can improvise that dungeon right right. Um, but if I don't have a map, that compounds it a lot. Right. Like I need a map, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. I do a lot of homebrew stuff, of course, and I, I make up most of my stuff. So like that mm -hmm. kind of gets a little hard to where like when you're thinking about where they could possibly go, like I said in the beginning, is like, all right, so I know they're going to be going through this mountain range. All right, well, I need to prepare or I need to have at least a map for these different spots along the way. And maybe yeah. you have an encounter of certain types of creatures and you have that, you can separate that from a map and they can encounter those creatures at map one, map two, map three, wherever that, you know, it naturally mm -hmm. happens to go. Yeah. So um, it digitally, it's a lot harder. Like I, I would uh, draw out my maps or whatever, that's, have it all prepared. Uh, so that's a whole nother map, digital map, roll 20 <laughs> world now. 
<laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that's like the biggest downfall of having to play online is digital maps and stuff. Yeah. Whereas if in person, it's like, I'm just drawing it out on a grid paper. Wee! <laughs> yeah. you know, and, then, and then roll 20, it's like, oh gosh, it's gotta be, you know, yeah. Where's so. a forest with a bridge in the center and they have a, a boulder <laughs> that's fallen on the right. And where, it, I just can't. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's a whole other thing, but. But honestly, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, Google has a lot of great images that I, I search for and find if, if I'm yes. not streaming it i know you stream some of your games and stuff yeah you gotta watch out for that um but there's a lot of images you can just take and make sure make use make use of mm -hmm. uh there's and some other things out there we should probably do a video on finding maps yeah well there and there's also a lot of people on patreon that like create high yeah. quality professional maps up, you can become a do, patron yeah. and get tons of high quality resources too yeah. so yeah. yeah it's beautiful but yeah i think the biggest thing that people sometimes focus on too much is they're instead of thinking about preparing for the adventure preparing mm -hmm. for the players and what the players are doing and having this player focused preparation they will spend a lot of their quote quote game prep building their world and flushing out its its civilizations and history uh, and lore dude no Bu world building is not game prep <laughs> <laughs> number 3 no one cares about your world <laughs> so this is like lots and lots and lots of dungeon masters get all like giddy up and all excited to create their own homebrew game world with mountains and cities and civilizations Planets and, and planes and everything new races gods, it's, it's like pantheon oh, the oh, entire oh. pantheon and they want to do all of these things and it's a good thing it's a beautiful thing for dungeon masters to do if you like doing that do it but i think that the pitfall here is that dungeon masters need to realize that world building is for them world building is for dungeon masters it's a way that dungeon masters can have a creative outlet in their games they can get their creativity out on paper right. i would inspire the dungeon master when you're doing this like whenever you're in your own head doing this like you said for yourself try and think about those players that are playing in that world and try and where could you plug them into that would be a great mm. you know hybrid game prep of like world building and weaving their backstory of where they came from this kingdom and they came from mm. this kingdom because it oh. had war with this kingdom and just weaving the players character backstories into your world to make them feel more a part yeah. of it and draw them in yeah absolutely totally do that uh, because the Unfortunately, the cold hard truth is that a lot of times players just don't care about your world. Like that that is not why they are yeah. playing the game. They are not playing the game learn to the learn history. about your to learn about your fantastical world, the lore and history of it. Yeah. They just a lot of times don't care about that. Yeah. Players care about their characters and the adventures they go on. Yeah. And this and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before with game prep and what do you prioritize in game prep? Like players, they, they care about their characters and the adventures. So when I am prepping for a game, because I know that players don't really care about the world that much, that's the backdrop. It's the, the you know, are you watching what's going on behind me here in the video or are you paying attention <laughs> to my face and we're talking about, right. Eh, right? So like when I'm prepping, I'm prioritizing the adventure I'm prioritizing the character's backstory and what I might do there and how to bring that into the game and into the adventure. Right. The world building part is is not the most important thing. Yeah. Let them ask for that. You know what I mean? Like, like if it's a you, you're this awesome person that built this huge entire history and lore, that's great. And if there's a statue off in the distance, let them see that statue. Mm -hmm. But don't lore dump on them about everything that has to do with who that represents. Maybe throw yeah. a little nugget out there, a one sentence thing about like this ancient history with the thing. And like maybe if yeah. they go up and inspect it or look yes. for more, then give yes. them a little bit more. Not all of it. Just give them a little bit more. And give them as much as they ask for and what they're engaging with. For sure. Right. Yeah. It's, 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 it's that's, a, that's one of the three pillars exploration, yeah. right? You, you give them a teaser, they go and peek around, poke around, explore a little bit. You give them some more information and then you can develop, you can unveil more of your world to them, unveil your world to them. And then they're going to learn more about it. Um, but it needs to be done organically, right? right. Not these like information dumps. Um, but I'm not, I'm not saying that dungeon, I'm not discouraging dungeon masters from world building. I'm not saying don't do it. <laughs> I'm just saying to recognize its relative importance compared to the other right. things that are going on in the game world. If you prioritize world building and neglect the things that are more important, then your game probably isn't going to be as good as it could have been. Right. Make sure that you're ready for your session. And that, like what I would do is I'd make sure I was ready for that week's session. And then I would flush out extra stuff about what's going on and all that other kind of stuff, which was nice for me too, because it made future game preps mm -hmm. maybe easier because I understood my world better so that yeah. I knew how it would react to the players 
messing with it and stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah. And another thing to add to that is I each of your players are different. Just because one is interested in the Lord doesn't mean they everyone should hear your disposition of every of the entire layout. So there's there was one character at my or one player at my table that really loved the lore and this like interesting little guy, like the mm -hmm. situation going on with the gods. It was a paladin and he was really interested in that. So in between sessions, I would talk with him and let him know about all those different types of things that he, when he read that book in the library, this is what mm -hmm. you read, you know, not dragging everybody else into it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's totally true. I, I am a big proponent. I mean, so like I personally, I do not homebrew my own worlds. I okay. use established settings. It has been forgotten realms and I'm going to probably transition to Eberron and stuff in the future, Ooh. but I, I use these established worlds because people have already done that work for me right. and it allows me to have more time to put into the game elements that are more important. I feel for right. my games. So, and I would yeah. even say for new dungeon masters, because that's what this whole thing's about, is fall back on those. Like if you really mm -hmm. have certain things, and kind of like we said about prep in general, tweak the things from a pre-existing setting that yeah. you can add in your own this or that, or, or make this new bad villain that's a part of this certain section or whatever, but have that general stuff that's already done for you so that you right. can focus on becoming a better dungeon master and getting other things in line, because yeah. there's so much to it. Yeah, it could still be your world, but you just steal a little bit from Eberron that interests right. you yeah. or, you know, Dark Sun that interests you. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, totally. Number four, try and say yes. Players want to do something and you, I want to try and make it work. I hate having to like shoot down a player's really awesome idea that they're really excited about. So I try when I can uh, to make things work. And, mm -hmm. and figure out a way to make it happen. Yeah. Now, now, now let me stop you right there. Oh, yeah. I would, I, I would say that it is less the dungeon master's job of how to make it work and more of the player's job for how to make it work. And what I mean by right. that is yeah. have your player explain how they're going to try to do it. Okay, yeah. they want to they want to do X thing. Your first impulse is, holy crap, how that's, that's impossible. not possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So instead of saying no, go right back to them and say, oh, that's, okay, how would you try to do that? Now, a lot of times the player will give you an ingenious way of doing it that you didn't even think of. And you're like, oh, okay, I guess that is possible. Or the player will think about it and be like, yeah, you know what? I don't know how I would do that. I guess that's not really possible. And then, and then they will talk themselves out of it or talk themselves to a more reasonable position and you don't have to say no. 100% I agree because they'll come up with something crazy that sounds crazy. You're like, mm -hmm. there's no way. And they might tell you something brilliant and you're like, oh my God, I didn't even know you had that spell. I didn't even know you had that item. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. Or they're like, oh, I don't really know. <laughs> and then you got nothing. And, and right. I would then sometimes as a dungeon master to try and explain, all right, you realize what would need to happen for this? Do you really, and like just to try and, cause you don't want to just say no and then move on mm -hmm. to the next thing. Then they feel like, oh, you know, like this guy, Yeah. but like you realize that you can only jump this far and you would have to jump twice as far to be able to do this thing you're saying. And like, oh, okay. And like, just so mm -hmm. that they can feel like, okay, actually that was crazy yeah. what I was doing. So they can, at least it sits right with them, you know? Yeah, I agree. And one, <clears throat> another thing too, just sparked my memory of um, when they want to do something that's almost impossible, that's very, very challenging. Sometimes I'll just simply tell my player, Okay, you can attempt to do that, but I want to let you know that that's going to be very difficult. Oh, right. And if you fail, there could be grave consequences. <laughs> oh, so be that. aware. Yes, you know? yes, yes. And like, this is going to be, and, and this is a time where, and this is a whole other thing, but I'll tell them that's going to be a DC 25. Like, that's going to be a DC 30. Like, you know, hit a nat 20. You know what I mean? And so then, you straight up sometimes tell them the DC is. First, in these type of situations, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm like, all right, you realize that's going to be a DC 25. If you want to do this thing and you want to try and mm -hmm. do this, it's going to be DC, DC 25. Or like you said, you're going to fall down this thing and then all the rest of you guys are going to have to figure something out to go save them. And they're like, all right, I'm doing it. And I'm like, whoo, let's go. And they know. Yeah. And we do the backwards math to calculate what they have to roll in the D20. And everyone's like, here we go. And they're looking at the dice. So, so it yeah. becomes a big dramatic yeah, game moment yeah, at that point. Sure. Yeah, love cool. it. Um, yeah. So, and then on that note too, though, is if they can't, if it, if the smoke clears and the dust settles mm. and they can't end up doing it, I'll talk mm. about like, like you could go down this path, you know, like if you really want to do this thing, if you want to cast this magic in a certain way, you can go down this path and maybe try it. And that's the homebrewer in me of like, Ooh, mm. interesting. You want to try and do this certain thing with a spell, like, okay. And like, try to be able to manipulate it in some way and like spend some time in downtime or multiple repetitions later on to try and get this mm -hmm. thing to happen if it's possible or if I think it could be possible. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. 
Yeah, that's beautiful. At the end of the day, you know, when you can say yes, you want to be able to say yes to move things along. And and you don't want to, like, you know, crush your players hopes and dreams and be like, no, right. you can't lie. Right. Like, you, you know, as much as possible, you want to, you know, facilitate the gameplay and move things forward, you know, as much as it's reasonable. I would say the the other thing here, the last little piece for me is it also comes from where they're coming from this question this thing that they want to do where is mm -hmm. it coming from matters a lot to me if they want to change fireball into an ice ball and mm -hmm. have it be a constitution saving throw instead of something like that i'm like oh mm -hmm. wow and if it's because that their character is like this ice sorceress that came from this land and mm -hmm. all of her spells are now ice and all that kind of stuff, oh okay cool i see that yeah let's do it yeah instead yeah. of someone who knows that the thing is a constitution saving throw so they're trying to dip around and do this like <laughs> and they're just mm -hmm. trying to beat the game in some mm. hacking way that's yeah. a different place where you're coming from and that right. it sits a little different with me right yeah that, that makes sense it's the role playing versus the metagaming mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. like it's also that's like a situation too where a yes but might be appropriate yeah. so it's like okay you want to take fireball and turn it into a you know, uh, a cold ball with a constitution saving throw. That's great, but it's going to retire. It's re going to require some downtime and yeah. some research exactly. for you to be able to figure out how to do that. It's not something you could just do, bam, oh, yeah. right on the spot <laughs> with an arcana check. It's, it's not going to work that way. That's yeah, too easy. Sure. So it's going to take a little something else for you to do it. Now, also, one other thing I wanted to say too about saying yes and not saying no is many of the memories I have of the regrets that I have in the game yeah. are moments when I just said no no to a player and later on i was thinking about it. i'm like oh luke you know what you should have you should have yeah. asked them how they could do it yeah. you should have seen if there was a way to say yes now it's not it's not to say you should ever say no but it's like though i'm just saying when i the times i've said no and then and i those are the regrets sometimes that i have not you all think the time about it afterwards but, you're like ah they were so exactly. excited and yeah, maybe exactly. there's, yeah, for sure. And, and I, I crushed their hopes and dreams. They went off and cried <laughs> in a corner and, and you know, it was, it was, it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Number five, it's okay to say no. <laughs> So, the opposite so, of what we just said. I know it's like, don't. It's not, I don't know what the, these guys are just contradicting themselves. Always say yes. <laughs> Number five. Always say no. So the the thing is, is that sometimes a player is going to want to do something. They're going to ask for something, and there's just no way it's not going to happen. You could have a you could have a player, for instance, with a level one character, and they're like, Luke. I want to be a lich. I want my <laughs> level one character to be a lich. And you're just like, okay, you want to, and I want to have all of these spells and all of these powers and immunities and stuff. And you're just like, um, no, no, uh, no that's not, that's not going to happen because, because it's not, not, of course you might do a yes, but you might, you might homebrew a thing where they can right. grow into a more powerful lich. So there's a possibility <laughs> there, but their direct ask, which is to be a powerful lich at level one is right. going to be no. a no. It's no. just, it breaks, it breaks right. the game. It breaks certain things and, and it's not fair to the other players right. why do you get to start off as a cr 21 or whatever it is yeah. and they're all level ones like that's that you think they're just gonna be like oh that's fine that's fine i don't feel bad about that at all no yeah. they're 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 gonna hold that against you dude i so. had i had to reference a high school example earlier you uh -huh. know because imagine high schoolers with this okay is um uh, we had built our characters everybody had their character and then one character's like mm -hmm. can i have a pet dragon i'm like wait wait you're not even a ranger. And maybe if we were going down, like, like uh -huh. if there's some sort of like, okay, they straight up just wanted an animal companion, which yeah. is already an ask in the first place to just straight mm -hmm. up have one on top of everything else you get, which is something I, I've, I've seen myself doing before, but a dragon and like, oh my goodness. So I was like, right. all right, look, um, this is a no, but this would be something that's probably, and trying to be honest with them just so that they aren't like constantly thinking about it. Like mm -hmm. what it would take for you to have a pet dragon that you ride on is so yeah. far down to the point where we're ever going to be able to do in this high school D and D session right now. We would need to. Be, it's it's that's oh you know it's just so that they can kind of yeah. like, okay and then settle in on some other idea so they're not just like strung along. You know I think that's important too. Right. And and again it's like you said no to the initial idea, but maybe maybe they could go on an adventure to find a dragon egg that they like, might incubate yeah, yeah, and then yeah. raise and then it's a, a little small little tiny, lizard pet you know that's and like it's a, gonna that. it's gonna be a little lizard yeah. pet it could be a familiar or something right. but it's gonna take years to get bigger <laughs> you know centuries to get super right. big and that might be part of once the campaign is ended and they're talking about what their characters do yes, in the future the exposition they can, yes. they wrap that up and talk mm -hmm. about the dragon maturing and stuff like that yeah. you know but you can't say yes to having a dragon pet right out of the <laughs> gate dude you 
can't, man. You can, that's like right. one of those things where you got to be like, no, 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 yep. <laughs> it's not gonna well, happen. And actually, for that group, there was this. They they came upon the. Uh, actually, was this was earlier on in my DMing. Uh, I ran through uh, the Fandelver cave, right, with the mm -hmm. little pack of wolves to the right. Okay. I added an extra little pup wolf <laughs> into that little pack of yeah. wolves that was that was chained up in the corner. And guarantee you that player snagged it up and now that it had an animal companion, you know? So I mm -hmm. knew the ask. It was on the back of my mind. I wrote yes. it down on my sheet to make sure to come back yeah. to, mm -hmm. to make sure that I like pay respect to that player's, you know, some right. way. And, and, and what we're basically, we now have three examples kind of that are basically saying not just an outright no, but it's right. a no, but right. like, no, you can't have what you're asking, but let's see <laughs> if we can come to something that kind of gives you that, but doesn't break the game. Doesn't make right. you more powerful than other players and make them feel like, you know, that it's not fair and stuff like that, right. you know? So you, you always want to try to take something that you have to say no to and figure out if there's something you could give them that right. isn't game breaking. On, on another category, away from this player, like fantasy type stuff, like what their goals are, is something mm -hmm. like maybe even combat or mechanically when you have to say no, like, can I do this crazy thing to where yeah. like, it would break the immersion of how gravity works. It would break like right. all of yes. physics. And I know we're playing a fantasy <laughs> game, but like you have to keep some sort of established like limits yes. to things to where they can't like, like mm -hmm. jump to over a moon or do like jump across like something crazy. You know, your players are not going to ask to jump over a moon, but like something to yeah. where you're like, all right, that's like, th that wouldn't be, possible here like and try and explain why so that they can again feel mm -hmm. good about it so you're not just like that's stupid who's next you know it's just to dismiss them because that's <laughs> yes, just not don't, don't just be that's stupid never no that's 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 stupid it's stupid to say that's stupid yeah agreed <laughs> but now i think you're stupid for saying that someone else is stupid for saying <laughs> well you're you're stupid no no oh god <laughs> High now we're in high school. Now we're, we're in high, high school. school. <laughs> nice. Now, as part of my collaboration with the Dungeon Coach, this month's issue of Layer Magazine includes extra content created by the Dungeon Coach. My $15 and up patrons will get a magic tattoo system, several ready to go magic tattoos, and three new player subclasses the Artificer Inksmith, the Bard College of Ink, and the Warlock Ancestral Spirits. So if you're not a patron yet and want to get Layer Magazine and this month's bonus content, click that link below to my Patreon. You'll also be getting two complete D&D 5th edition adventures, The Worm Witch, designed for level five groups, and Talakonsky's Revenge, designed for level eight groups. If you enjoyed staring at our marvelous beards this whole time, give this video a thumbs up and leave a comment for the algorithm down below. Let YouTube know that we don't suck. And until next time, go grow a beard!